In this presentation, I'm going to talk about my own art and my path in wood-fired ceramics. And of course, this book has been a big part of that. I have had a wonderful um, journey working with Kusakabe and writing this book and getting deeply involved in wood-fired ceramics. And one of the questions that came up with me early on in my work is why in the face of all the modern conveniences that we have as ceramic artists, um, why are we internationally choosing to wood fire? Um, and I think only beauty offers an acceptable explanation. And it can't be just a beauty that's like, oh, that's lovely, casually noted beauty. It can't be like that. It has to be something something um, extraordinary. It has to be heart-achingly arresting beauty, a beauty of epic proportions, a beauty worth working for, a beauty only achievable by way, by way of wood firing. It can be no less. For what other goal would artists dedicate so much time and effort? And here's an example of one tea bowl fired in our Rosinante kiln. And this is a kind of teapot that I make called a tri teapot. Three feet. Here is a sculpture that's just shy of five feet tall. Fired in the back chamber of our dancing fire wood kiln. This is the Nabore Gama chamber, and you can see how much ash and color is available in that chamber. So my wood firing adventures began um, back in 1989 when I took a course, a workshop with Fred Olson. And I built a kiln with him. And that kiln uh, was up at Sierra Nevada College in Lake Tahoe. And we built that kiln and fired it in one week. It was really an amazing workshop. And I really enjoyed Fred. I found him to be very inspiring and extremely instructive. And he invited me to come down to Palm Desert and fire with him in his Anagama kiln. And I did that. I was very interested in, in learning um, everything I could about wood fire. And Fred Olson is one of the great heroes of wood fired ceramics in America. Um, one of the first American uh, artists as a young man to uh, apprentice himself to a Japanese living national treasure. He studied with Tomimoto as his apprentice for many, many years in Japan. And he's become a, a mentor and a friend, and he's really where my wood firing knowledge started. Here in this photograph, we're leaning against a kiln that he built at Guliagor, which is the International Ceramics Research Center in Skelskor, Denmark. And um, when, after he built it, soon after he built it, he asked, he, he, he told me, you know, Mark, you really have to go out and fire that kiln. It's really something amazing. And I don't know if you can see what you're looking at here. I wrote an article about it uh, in Ceramics Technical where I called it a low-flying piece of architecture. And if you look, it has two fire mouths and two chimneys. One of the chimneys is three chambers. So it's an extraordinary kiln. It fires beautifully, and it's really quite fun to fire. This is Fred Olson's kiln book. Uh, that I believe is in the 5th or 6th edition now. So when I came, uh, when I, one of the reasons I wanted to study with Fred is I knew I was going to Japan on a sabbatical and my brother had gotten me an invitation to work with Kusakabe. Kusakabe had invited me into his studio for a month or two and um, I was coming to Japan and I wanted to have an exposure to Japanese ceramics, a deeper exposure, but I could not do an apprenticeship because I had, I had six months, not seven years. And Kusakabe was the one to point that out when my brother uh, contacted Kusakabe, who was a friend of his, and said, hey, Mark wants to uh, do some kind of one or two month apprenticeship. Kusakabe laughed and he said, just come to my studio. He says an apprenticeship is seven years and the first year is sweeping the studio and the second year is wedging clay. Mark does not want to do that. He's a college professor, just come to my studio. And that was a kind of generosity that Kusakabe 
uh, became, continued to practice. And here's a picture from that first time back in uh, 1993, 92, I believe, um, in Kusakabe Studio, 1992. And here I am firing Kusakabe's kiln. And that became a very important collaboration. Not only was Kusakabe showing me about traditional Japanese forms, but I was showing him a lot about uh, uh, non-traditional American ceramic sculpture and texturing and different kinds of techniques. So it was a beautiful exchange that we got going. And who knew at this time, who knew what would become of this collaboration? We began to work together every summer in the United States. We would present workshops together, exhibitions together, uh, build kilns together, and eventually, of course, we wrote a book together. Here are some photographs from those years. 15 years of a really strong collaboration. This is uh, on the right is a picture of us uh, finishing up the chimney for our dancing fire wood kiln. And here's the team that built the kiln with us, the dancing fire wood kiln. So fantastic experience. And the kiln still fires quite successfully. Here is the uh, celebration. We had Tycho drums celebrating our 10 year anniversary. We've since had a 20th anniversary and 2023 becomes the 25th anniversary of this kiln. Uh, I love this picture for a number of reasons. In particular, I love it because uh, my daughter is holding a brick. I think that's very funny. My daughter's now 14 and wouldn't be in this photo. Um, anyway, a crew of us got together one time when Kusakawi and I were doing a series of workshops. We ended up with four free days, and for fun, we built an experimental kiln um, that Kusakabe wanted to try a few ideas before he went on to build a kiln at Harvard. The ideas that he wanted to try turned out not to work, so it was a good thing we tried them out um, on that kiln. Here's the close-up of my... I just love that picture. Um, the, the kiln didn't work. Um, it, was, it fired very, very poorly. We, the ideas that we were experimenting with were um, misguided. So here we are in uh, Zing, uh, Zindazen, China, where we traveled and did workshops and firings uh, in celebration. We also did exhibitions in China and uh, did book signings because our book was um, printed in Chinese. So this is kind of an interesting idea. You know, I can load an electric kiln in less than an hour and just flip a switch and it will fire. Um, so the question becomes, why do we choose wood fire when we have all these different options that are much less labor intensive? And the answer is kind of in the question because um, it's, um, it's really our artistic vision that can't be satisfied by any other surface, by any other choice. Um, in, in the ancient times, a thousand years ago, the ceramicists had to use wood fire. There was no other source of heat and fuel. But in the 21st century, we have so many choices, and most of them are computer guided, not requiring much of our time. But yet we choose to do seven day firings where we're working around the clock. I know some people who choose to do 10 day firings, and uh, you're working 24 seven. So um, there must be, um, I think that idea that we have so many choices that are quicker, easier, indicates that it's, it's very much a 21st century idea. We're artists, very, very contemporary artists, because we're pursuing our vision over common sense. Here's another example. At Solano Community College, we have Raku that takes about 45 minutes to an hour. And then we have gas kilns that are computer guided. Um, we have so many choices. Here is our dancing fire wood kiln, and it requires seven days and cools for another, another seven days. And that's not accounting preparing the wood. So the wood preparation, about eight cords of wood, takes about a month uh, to prepare. Um, and so that's a total cycle of about six to seven weeks from start to finish. Here's the crew, part of it, a part of the crew, um, working towards finishing our... Um, Rosanante kiln, which was a completely different style of kiln. Here it is 
um, in its finished state. It's a Bori box kiln, which, uh, which indicates that the fire box is very, very different than an anagama, and yet it's a very powerful kiln, and it's very akin to the smokeless Saskane kiln that is chapter four of the book I wrote with Kusakabe. This um, kiln fires extremely efficiently, 60 hours for a deep ash effect, um, 18 hours to melt glaze, so it's very quick. Um, and we call it the Rosanante kiln. And here are some uh, examples. This is, uh, these are some pieces that I intentionally caused to crack and then placed them very, very close to the, um, in the fire mouth. And you can see in both cases, you can see evidence of erosion. Those grooves on the left there that you see um, are an, uh, an artifact of that position in the kiln. And those grooves are carved uh, by ash that melts the clay, it turns it to glass and it drips down and, and follows uh, the path of least resistance. It starts to carve erosion grooves in the piece. And here are a couple of vases. You can notice, if you look here, you see that angle of uh, what is called konge, that kind of dark uh, encrusted uh, embers that are stuck to the piece and here too you see that that angle is characteristic of the of the Rosanante kiln it's the angle of the embers that build up and slope in from the firebox into the wear chamber so pieces that you put there can feature that angle here's a special part of the kiln underneath the firebox this is fired upside down and it's fired it's a piece of um, it, it's a bowl, tea bowl, that was already glazed with Lancet's Oribe and then was refired upside down in the back of the kiln, right under the firebox. And here, this is another tea bowl fired in the Rosinante kiln. Here's a tea bowl fired upside down on a uh, sea, on a seashell, on a scallop shell, and here's what the bowl looks like. So these are just examples of the kind of beauty that comes out of the Rosinante kiln, and the reason it's so important is that some of those pieces look like they've been firing for 10 days, not 60 hours. So it is a real um, powerful kiln. Here's some wood. Um, again, it takes, it, it, we basically burn one cord a day, and a cord is four feet by four feet by eight feet. So um, we spend a month preparing eight cords of wood for the dancing fire wood kiln. And here you can see that characteristic angle. This piece was fired in the Saskane kiln uh, in Japan at Kusakabe's studio. Beauty is the experience that gives us a sense of joy and a sense of peace simultaneously. Beauty is serene and at the same time exhilarating. It increases one's sense of being alive. And that's by Rollo May, My Quest for Beauty, is the book that he wrote that in. So what I started to notice as I was doing tea bowls, uh, more and more tea bowls, is that when I used them in the tea ceremony, I would uh, mix them, and then I would, I would mix tea in them and drink from them, and then I would be done. And here was this bowl um, that I had to put away in the box and not look at anymore. But I loved looking at it, and I wanted to keep looking at it. And so I came up with the idea of making paintings. And that started a whole series of paintings um, that I call the fire painting series. Here's a close-up. And this is a painting by Jackson Pollock called Full Fathom Five. And this is a, a fire painting by me, which I named Full Fathom Five as an homage to Jackson Pollock. Here's a piece by Franz Klein the great painter. And here's one of mine. And of course I am trying to make some pretty strong associations here with action painters that I deeply admire. Here's another Franz Klein piece. And here's a bowl that reminded me so much of that particular painting that I named it Franz. This is a Mark Rothko, and here's a Mark Lancet. So again, Rothko believed that he would create a 
situation where gazing upon his paintings would give you the experience of transcending uh, your own awareness into a deeper appreciation of beauty. I like that. So hopefully that's what these paintings will do. Here's another close-up of a painting. This one is called How One Surrenders to the Emptiness. And another painting called Words Still Gently Fade Before the Unsayable. I am grass, let me work. Not thought exactly, a refrain. So these paintings are done with a combination of slips and stains and glazes that are all painted on the slab in greenware. And then, then um, the piece is bisque fired and then loaded into the kiln. Now I'm going to show you some tea bowls to give you a sense of the wide range of what's possible. And these are a few selected tea bowls. And I thought I'd mention, I'm very happy to announce the launching of my new website, lancetteaware.com. For years, I haven't found a way to get my tea bowls out in front of the world. And so I've created a website of just tea bowls and flower vases. Though I think at current, currently it's mostly tea bowls. The flower vase section needs some work. Here's a tea bowl that was fired uh, in Japan in the Sasuke smokeless kiln in Kusakabe's studio. And it was fired at the very top, uh, just, just slightly, um, pretty much at the top at the bag wall height. And here's a Shino tea bowl. And this is kind of a special effect. This tea bowl was uh, painted with a slip of Shigaraki clay that had a lot of feldspathic and um, um, quartz stone in it to give it this effect. And this piece is currently in the collection of the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. And I've always loved this, this bowl. Uh, the colors are extraordinary. The textures are fantastic. And then it features the idea that some, some cracks are good cracks. And this crack in Japanese would be referred to as yama ware. And a yama is a good thing. It's, it's a word for mountain, but it means it's just an enormously great crack or fissure. Another tea bowl that features a shelf drip in a very prominent way. To those who, only, who wait only for flowers, show them a sprig of grass amid the snow in a mountain village. This is a uh, famous poem that points to the very important idea that you want to meet your work as it comes out, you don't want to be waiting for a specific look or a specific kind of piece to emerge from the kiln. You want to meet each piece as it emerges and get to know its own particular beauty. So now I'm going to show you a few things that, I've, that I have been involved with. These are two characters from art history. To the right is Senyo Rikyu, the famous tea master, uh, active in the mid-1500s. And to the left is Joseph Beuys, who was active in, in the uh, 1950s in Germany and throughout the world. He was a, a famous artist known for um, so many um, things, including performance art, conceptual art, uh, starting the green uh, political movement, um, many different ideas. And the reason that these pieces are here is because um, I was involved with the project with the artist who's featured on the left here, Sabina Turpinen, the great uh, West German artist. She's uh, from the Munich area. And um, she and I did a collaborative exhibition of teaware at the Fluxus Museum in Potsdam based on the principles that the Fluxus Museum 
uh, was dedicated to the Fluxus art and the parallels between the philosophy of Japanese tea in the 16th century and the Fluxus art movement in the 20th century were very strong. There were many, many connections. And so we had an exhibition that featured those ideas, um, featuring the my teaware and flower vases and those of Sabine, Sabina Turpinen back in 2012. The Fluxus Plus Museum in Potsdam, Germany. And the principles that we played with were these ideas that um, things like this, this is a piece by Wolf Vassell called uh, Traffic Jam. And um, there's an actual car cast under that block of cement. And then I was suggesting that perhaps also we could take a moment to realize that that Wolf Vostel had captured a similar sense of stillness and quietude and contemplation that is always at the heart of the tea ceremony. And here's that orange tea bowl again that became the poster bowl for this exhibition. I also, uh, in my essay, compared uh, the work and the, the, the aesthetics of Japanese tea with the ideas of Yoko Ono. Here, the famous cut piece where Yoko Ono sat quietly on stage next to a scissors and invited anybody in the audience to come and cut any piece of clothing off of her that they wished. Um, and the, the proposal that I made is, while it is a very different kind of contemporary conceptual art than Japanese tea, the goal of tea is to inspire a self-awareness of the, the moment and uh, the activity and of beauty. And whatever was going on in this um, cut piece by Yoko Ono, I guarantee you that every person that came up to cut some clothes off of Yoko Ono was hyper aware of where they were and what they were doing. So as part of that exhibition, we did a series of, um, we did a workshop, which was fabulous. Myself and this gentleman, um, so he was the tea master, I was the clay person, so I taught ceramics for tea and flowers. And then he taught a, a day about what kinds, how he chooses and thinks about and look, what he looks for in ceramics for tea. And we also had a floor of uh, Ikebana artists talk about ceramics for Ikebana. And the next year I was invited to be the uh, first speaker at the International Ikebana Conference in Berlin. And so I spoke to the crowd, the opening talk. And I was also the featured artist in an exhibition at the Berkeley Ceramics Museum. And here the idea was looking at pieces that could be involved in flower arrangement. And there is a concept in Japanese arts, tea and flowers and perhaps ceramics, uh, the concept of do, you've heard it in judo, but also kado is, is flower arranging and chado is the tea ceremony. And do, the way, it's an art that allows us to understand the ultimate nature of the whole of life by closely examining ourselves through a very singular activity of life to arrive at a universal through the study of the particular. So that's what Do means in this sense, that, that you, are, you are crafting a soul, in a sense, as you work very specifically on, on your art. And so Kado is the way of flowers. Here's Hedi Desuyo, who has done most of the flower arranging over the years in my pieces for, for photographs that she then takes, because she's also a great photographer. This is the piece she was working on. So I'm fascinated with, um, with Ikebana, Kado, with the idea of arranging flowers uh, to bring beauty into the moment and into your life. And here are two different arrangements in the same hanging flower vase. Togedo, the way of ceramics. So I think that's true. There's some truth to this that for us, we experience a kind of um, 
uh, centering down as a sense of uh, self-awareness and coming to understand our place in the universe just by our continually returning to our practice of working in clay. And here are some more flower vases. This is the Berlin Museum of Ceramic Art. I think it was the oldest building in this sector of Berlin. And there's my talk and, and this is the exhibition uh, where um, it was my art and then pieces from a collection. And I also did a performance art piece here with these two fine Ikebana artists. And I would throw vases, wet vases, and then carry them over to the table where they would begin to arrange them. And so I would throw them uh, as people watched and then carry them over and place them where they told me and then they would begin to arrange with them, sometimes poking uh, stems through the side of the piece. And it really grew across the table about, I think I made about six or eight vases in 45 minutes. And here you can see an example of um, how one vase is constantly a stage for different kinds of compositions. Again, all of these are arrangements, Ikebana arrangements by Hedy de Suyo. The intersection of clay, tea, and flowers um, is something that I told you we did this workshop. We did it at the uh, Ceramic Paradise or Ceramic Studio of this person here. This is Marcus Bohm and his um, his studio is located in the very northeastern corner of Germany in Altgartz. I love this particular arrangement in this vase. This is the same vase from the other side. So lots of uh, possibilities, lots of uh, beautiful arrangements uh, can, be, um, can, can be explored over the lifetime of a vase. Here again, two different arrangements in the same vase. And so the other thing I want to show you um, is that um, I also use wood firing to finalize the surfaces of ceramic sculpture. And I'm not going to get too much into talking about these sculptures and what drives them. You can ask me about that later, perhaps. But this is a series I've been working on. Uh, it's contemporary. I've been working on it till the present day. Um, you can see there, some of them are quite large. They range from about two feet to, as you can see here, nine feet, eight feet or nine feet. Um, This one is called She Walks in Beauty as the Night. This is Dave. And here are the most recent, these are some images of the most recent pieces. This is called Quixotic. You can see there an interplay of all kinds of architectural imagery uh, along with abstract figurative work. And this one is, has a kind of funny story. I actually built the bottom half of this piece uh, 20 years, no, yeah, about 20 years before I built the top half because um, there was a finished top half, uh, but my mother-in-law knocked it over and broke it, so I had to make a new top half, which turned out to be much better. So I, I recreated the piece and made it better, and I named it after my mother-in-law. And sometimes I'll work smaller. These are, this is uh, about 20 inches tall. Um, just because it's a different kind of expressiveness and I can move a lot quicker and I can get um, different kinds of effects. And I'm throwing in these to 
say that I do also make masks, and they're kind of something else that shows up in my artwork. And again, not going into it, but this is the series of figures I was working on these abstract torsos uh, before I started with the series that you just saw, which I call the Luminous series. This series is called, um, uh, what is it called, the Abstract Torso series? I don't know if it really has a, a name other than that. Um, but this is, um, on the left is a piece called Hunter Gatherer. And on the right, it's called hibernaculum, which is a word which means the place that peoples or animals go to hibernate. So we don't really know what holds up, what, what the future holds. Um, you know, I had no idea. Actually, I had no real intention of getting that involved in wood fire. But like many things, you discover something and it becomes too attractive to resist. And um, I, think of, I think about what the future holds every day in regards to this charming child. This is a little bit unfair. She's uh, in this picture, I think she's four years old. Uh, now she is 14. So who knows what the future holds? We will see. Where will you all end up? What's going to come from all this?